the uh, uh, again the judgment that days to know is kind of the title of the message. We we'll go through the first eight verses, and in doing so, recall that uh, a few weeks ago, as we left off in Genesis five, there was the continuing depravity growing among uh, mankind. At the same time, there's always that sliver of hope because we have the line or the godly line of Seth that, uh, that comes about. We had the preaching of Enoch, a guy that walks with God. The Bible says that only uh, he and Noah uh, have that description. And then we know that he actually is raptured to be with the Lord at a point in time, but was a preacher of righteousness. So is Noah. Uh, and, um, and there were uh, people that uh, turned to the Lord probably during that time. But by and large, things are becoming more and more depraved. Why, why would a God of love uh, destroy all mankind? It's, uh, uh, things had to be pretty bad. And, uh, and the answer to that question as far as how bad it was is, is given to us in the, uh, about the first four or five verses here. Uh, N.T. Wright was a British uh, theologian of uh, uh, a couple generations ago, said this in 1948 that the biblical doctrine of God's wrath is rooted in the doctrine of God as the good, wise, and loving creator who hates, yes, hates and hates uh, anything that spoils, defaces, distorts, or damages his beautiful creation, and in particular, anything that does that to his image-bearing creatures. If God does not hate racial prejudice, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not wrathful at child abuse, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not utterly determined to root out from his creation in an act of proper wrath and judgment, the arrogance that allows people to exploit, bomb, bully, and enslave one another, he is neither loving nor good nor wise. God can't be good and not be a God of justice. And part of that justice is meeting out punishment uh, to those that, uh, that deserve it. And uh, that's what we see here uh, in these opening verses of chapter 6. Let's take a look at the first four verses. Again, the depravity of mankind on earth at this time. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. First thing we notice about the depravity of man, well, there's a a, a population explosion, uh, but along with that, unfortunately, a, pop, a growth in, or explosion in depravity as well. Now, again, Enoch is the preacher of righteousness. Time passes. Uh, the population continues to grow. Uh, and in time, people are forgetting what he said. What was he saying? There's a coming judgment. And if people don't repent and turn, turn towards God, God is going to bring this, this judgment. And certainly, that's a message that we, we hear about today. And, and again, why, why is this message so relevant to us? It's because of something that Jesus says. Jesus says, I will come again. The Son of Man will come again in days that are like the days of Noah. And I'll read the whole passage to you uh, towards the end of the message. So Jesus is going to come in a day like the days that we're, we're going to study about here. And, and in that, he says, they were marrying and giving in marriage. And people have a tendency to read that and go, oh, I guess everything is just kind of kind of like be real normal-like, and then Jesus comes back. Well, this is nothing but normal here, what we're about ready to study about. Uh, there's tremendous violence uh, in the culture. There's great depravity. There's great sexual sin. There's great demonic activity. This is, this is not like, hey, everything's just kind of normal. And that's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. And, uh, and certainly... That would describe some of the days that we're living in. But again, in verse 1, men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them. So as we approach this judgment of the flood, remember we said that in the 1,656 years from Adam to Noah, <clears throat> if each couple that married 
had sons and daughters, so they had at least two sons and at least two daughters. Could have had a few more than that as long as they lived. If that's all that they had, there would have been millions of people living on the earth at the time. If they had more than that, there would have been billions, some say equivalent to the population that's on the earth right now. Uh, the second thing about the depravity was scenes in the sons of God in their pursuit of wives. Uh, verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, the term took wives is used in the Old Testament for just that. And he took his wife and they, you know, uh, just kind of a normal two people get married kind of a thing. But this word can also mean to take by violence. Uh, and when it's coupled with the idea of whom they chose. So it's the idea that you have the sons of God, and we'll talk about who they are in a moment, taking women, could be married women or unmarried women, by force, violently, to be their, uh, their wives. So that's, that's what's going on during this time, taking women by force to be their wives. Uh, the depravity is seen uh, in this uh, whole description of the giants in the land. Very interesting uh, passage. The Hebrew word is uh, Nephilim, uh, and uh, the Nephilim, we'll see, are are the product of the sons of men who take wives by force. They have children with them. And there's something about who the sons of God are that caused these children to be very different from normal children. They are giants. Uh, and we'll see in the wording here that they are actually violent. Now, the, the word occurs also in Numbers 13.33. It's interesting because in verse 4 it says, And also afterwards... And there's a lot of debate, what does that mean? So there's these giants in the land, these men of renown uh, there during this time, and also afterward, after what? After the flood? You know, and there's some debate about that. But the same word occurs as Joshua is about ready to enter the land with Caleb and the other ten spies. And you remember, they go in and only Joshua and Caleb have a good report uh, and the others have a bad report because there's walled cities and... Uh, uh, and they make reference to the sons of Anak in, in Numbers 13, 33. It says, there were giants, same word, Nephilim, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So Joshua and Caleb says, there's giants, and we're like grasshoppers uh, compared to these guys. We're not talking about guys that are big enough to play in the NBA. We're talking about Goliath kinds of guys. There's another giant, the son of Anak, that we meet later in the life of David. But there's giants in the land prior to the flood. It's part of the depravity. Well, why? It's because they are the product of the sons of God, whoever they are, taking by force women to be their wives. And they are described as mighty men, men of old. Uh, in the Hebrew, that word is gibor, uh, and it's used uh, also of another fellow that gives us the indication that by mighty men, just doesn't mean how much they can bench or how buff they are. It means they're violent. So you've got these giant men, the product of the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men who are incredibly big and incredibly violent roaming the earth. The same phrase is used of Nimrod in Genesis 10:8. There it said, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a gibor, a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And uh, a lot of commentators, a lot of Bible scholars will say that that phrase there, before the Lord, should be against the Lord. Uh, the, the word can mean either. And if you follow who this guy is, he's against the Lord. He's the guy that builds the Tower of Babel. Uh, it comes, it's a, just a defiant act against God. We're not going to worship the Creator. We're going to worship the creation instead. We're going to look at these stars. We want the stars to tell us our future. We don't want God to tell us our future. That's who we're going to worship. That's Nimrod. But he was a mighty Egebor. He was a violent man, and he was against the Lord. That's the word that's used of these of these giants. So you've got these giants roaming the land. How bad does it have to get? Why would God destroy all of mankind? 
it's so bad because of these offspring that are giants in the land, that are violent men that are really taking over. Uh, and, uh, and again, so part of the depravity. The people themselves, the population explosion with the, the depravity right into it. And then secondly, not only the depravity, but the demonic control over the earth, which leads to one of the more controversial passages in Genesis, maybe the most, and that is the question, who are the sons of God? Well, as I tip my hand to what I think they are, I would say the demonic control of the earth is seen in the sons of God. There's three basic views among Jewish as well as Christian scholars, and they, they don't disagree. There's really only three views. One view says that the sons of God are the godly line of Seth. You have the line, the line of Cain. They're getting more and more depraved. Hope comes because Seth is born. Men began to call in the name of the Lord. Through him we have Enoch and so forth, all the way down to, uh, to Noah himself. Therefore, the sons of God versus the Canaanite or guys are the, uh, the godly line of Seth. And that's one view, and there's lots of uh, good Bible scholars that hold uh, that view, Jewish as well as, as uh, evangelical Christians. The second view is that the sons of God is a reference to the rulers in the line of Cain. So the rulers are kings. So the kings in the line of Cain are, are uh, uh, rule in such a way uh, in tyranny so that they just take whoever they want uh, to be their wives. And this is where you get the uh, idea of creating a harem and having more than one wife, this position would say. Part of the depravity, part of what's gone wrong, why God has to judge it. And of course, the third view is the correct view. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's the view that I hold, but I want to give you three reason, reasons why. Uh, one is, uh, it is the, it's the traditional view. Uh, this is the view that was held by uh, most Jewish scholars uh, from our very early writings uh, that uh, these sons of God are actually demonic, that you have uh, demons, fallen angels, the sons of God, that, that basically possess men and take them over, and then they procreate or take by force wives, and they produce children that are the giants. And uh, this view is, uh, again, found uh, in Jewish writings in, uh, in First Enoch, the book of Jubilees, the Septuagint, the writings of, of uh, Philo, Josephus, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was the uh, position of the early church as well, uh, writers like Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and uh, Origen. So it's the tr this is actually the traditional view. These other views actually don't come up until, uh, until later. And it's based on, again, the second reason is that the phrase, the sons of God, is used exclusively in the Old Testament for angels. It's not used for anything else. So you have to kind of lift it out of its context to get it to say it's the Canaanite kings or it's the uh, godly line of Seth. It's normally used like this in Job 1.6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Sons of God are angels. So the sons of God, in this case, fallen angels, part of the problem, part of the depravity, they possess a human body, so they're able to then take literally by force and violently, uh, again, have a wife for themselves, and what they produce are these giants. Alan Ross says the story describes these sons of God as lusty, powerful lot, striving for fame and fertility. And, of course, we, we see this idea, idea of demon possession throughout the New Testament. Uh, the third uh, reason, the New Testament passages that picture the time of Noah describe these beings. And we see it first in 1 Peter 3.19. Peter writing here says of uh, Jesus after his death, after his resurrection, he goes and he preaches to those in prison. He says, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. And the word spirits there is, um, is pneumata, always used of supernatural beings. So Peter is talking about supernatural beings that were held in prison 
who were formerly disobedient, and it was during the time of Noah. Then when he's writing in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, his second epistle, he says of these same creatures in the same time period, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, another judgment, into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterwards would live ungodly. So again, Peter says, these fallen angels are the ones who sinned. They've been cast down. Previously, he said, Christ went and preached to them. They're there waiting for their own judgment and destruction. Here held in chains of darkness. Why? Because of their sin during the days of Noah. And then in Jude uh, 6 and 7, the writer there says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these. Having given themselves over to sexual immorality, what was the problem with these angels? They're like Sodom and Gomorrah. They've given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, and they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So if you just take the, the plain, uh, the reason it's the traditionally held uh, view among Jews and Christians is because a plain reading, the sons of God, is always angels. There's really no reason to look for anything else. When they're spoken about in the New Testament, they're spoken about as pneumata, uh, again, supernatural beings, and they're described as having placed in a deep part of hell, basically awaiting eternal judgment because of their sexual perversion and sin that took place during the days of Noah. It kind of pinpoints it down. Just Jude's reference alone says there are angels who sinned against God. They're being held in reserve for judgment, and they're being judged because of sexual perversion. So that's why it's, it's really the uh, traditionally held uh, view. Uh, the reason people don't hold to it is that I think they end up rejecting in our modern mind this whole realm of the, of the spirit and what's going on and the whole idea of spiritual warfare and that God's angels are out there battling uh, on our behalf and for God's kingdom and our good and our protection and so forth. And we kind of don't see it or see the reality. We have a tendency to forget about it as well as the demonic. But I can tell you, there's a lot of places in the world today where it's a lot more obvious uh, and people are keenly aware of it uh, in places uh, that I've been, like in India, where uh, there's, there's always, uh, when, when something happens, they connect it to the spiritual realm. Uh, they're very concerned about demons and demon possession, and they're very concerned about uh, uh, spiritual warfare and what's going on. As we hear from our missionaries in Bangkok, for example, just some of the things that they have to battle and go through. I just think that Satan is not so frontal assault-like uh, with us in the Western world because he's doing pretty well flying under the radar uh, and he, I think he sees that he's much more effective lest we become so aware of him and what he's doing uh, in a sense. The uh, Wizard of Oz, the curtain from <laughs> is pulled back and we see who's really pulling the strings and what's going on. But uh, the, the one statement that Jesus makes that people that don't hold this view uh, is uh, in Luke 20. There the Sadducees are debating with Jesus about the resurrection. You remember the distinction between a Pharisee and the Sadducee. The Sadducees do not believe in angels. They don't believe in the spiritual realm. They do not believe in the resurrection. Therefore, they are Sadducee. And there I was always the debate with Jesus was over the resurrection. And even the Pharisees would line up behind Jesus and help him debate against these guys uh, when it came to the resurrection. But they come to him and they say, under the Torah, under the Mosaic law, when uh, a man died who was married, then, uh, then his wife would be obligated and the younger brothers would be obligated then to marry her in order to carry on to the family name. 
uh, and they said, under that law, what would happen if a guy was married and he died and his, his brother married her and then he died and then he died? So there's seven brothers. They all die. They all marry her. And there, if there is a resurrection, what are all these people going to do in heaven? These seven brothers with this one wife, whose wife is she going to be? And Jesus responds by saying, Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So there's in heaven no marriage nor giving in marriage, and uh, our relationships will be, uh, be different if you have a really bad marriage, then uh, this is a, a wonderful statement for you to know it won't go on for all eternity. It's just until death do us part. Uh, and uh, if you have a good marriage, well, I think your relationship is going to be awesome in heaven as well, as it will with, uh, uh, with everyone. But uh, people that don't hold to this idea of who the giants were and who the sons of God are and the demonic entities that enter these men in order to procreate, point to this scripture and say, see, angels can't have sexual relationships. They can't procreate because Jesus says so here in heaven, like the angels, there's neither marriage nor giving in marriage and so forth. So that's their defense. But again, uh, we would agree with that. I would agree with that statement, except that we know that demons are looking in the New Testament, in the scriptures, for bodies to possess whenever they can. I would just point out, apparently, it's very hard, or it would happen a lot more. So apparently, it's very hard for them to be able to do that, or it would happen a lot more. But when they can and they do, uh, then that gives them the vehicle to, uh, to procreate at that point. So uh, very uh, controversial passage of Scripture, uh, very interesting. One writer, uh, Old Testament scholar Gordon uh, Winman says, if the modern reader finds this story incredible, that reflects a materialism that tends to doubt the existence of spirits, good or ill. But those who believe that the Creator could unite Himself to human nature in the virgin's womb will not find this story intrinsically beyond belief. <laughs> if we believe in the virgin birth, uh, we shouldn't have trouble with this idea of what these uh, fallen angels have done. Again. Why would God have to destroy all mankind? And it's because of the promise in Genesis 3.15 that through the seed he would bring the Messiah. Satan comes in, the first frontal assault to prevent the Messiah was cut to come, just corrupt the seed. Corrupt, uh, corrupt human beings with his own demonic influence so that the Messiah, so there isn't a virgin through which to come. There isn't a person like Mary with that kind of character uh, and so forth. Uh, and it's been Satan's attempt on many occasions to prevent that. Here's the first, the next would be through Pharaoh. As the Jewish people are there living in Egypt, there comes a time, somehow Pharaoh gets the idea, again, satanically inspired, he needs to limit the growth of these people. He'll simply kill all the male children, all the Jewish male children. And he begins to slaughter them. And you know the story of Moses' mother, Jacobed, and how she uh, makes the basket and puts pitch and tar around it so it's waterproof, puts it in the Nile and so forth. Moses' life is spared and uh, ends up being raised in the court of Pharaoh himself. Then in Bethlehem, because the prophecies begin to narrow, it's going to be to the seed of the woman. He's going to be a male. Now the promise to Abraham, he's going to be a Jewish male. Now the promises and the promises narrow is going to be uh, of the lineage of Judah. Now it's, he's going to be of the lineage of David. Now he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And we have babies born in Bethlehem, wise men coming to Herod saying, the king of the Jews have been born. We've come to worship him. What does Herod say? Tell me when you find him. And of course, he goes then and satanically inspired kills all the male children to and under again attempt to stop the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. And of course, it doesn't end there. You've got uh, Hitler later trying to exterminate all Jews because Satan still realizes that in the end, if there is the remnant of the Jews that can cry out to bring him back to planet Earth, if I can destroy them, 
I can prevent the Messiah from coming and establish his kingdom. The, the reason that there is anti-Semitism in the world is because the Jews are God's people and they play a tremendous role in the whole story of redemption. Bringing the Messiah into the world and in the end, they are the remnant that cries out and brings him back again. So this is the first frontal assault to what God wants to do in terms of his plan of redemption. And it's pretty wicked, isn't it? It's pretty wicked. And it's, uh, it's so depraved of what's going on and things are so bad. Because, again, it's, it's, uh, it's mind-boggling to consider that, that millions and possibly billions of men and women and children would all be destroyed at one time in the flood. Things had to be pretty bad. The other thing about the demonic control, it's seen in the warning of God, which is sobering. And, uh, and, and good for us to understand, verse 3, And the Lord uh, said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Again, the warning that my spirit shall not strive. There are those that would say the word spirit is just a reference to man, my, that uh, man will not always strive. It, it almost doesn't make sense, but they'll make references to verses like Genesis 2, 7, when God uh, creates man and breathes into him and he becomes alive in his spirit. And it's just talking about the life of man. Uh, the problem I would have with that is that God says it's my spirit, not, not the spirit of a man that I'm talking about. And your Bible maybe, like mine, correctly capitalizes the word spirit indicating that it's God's spirit. Uh, God's spirit will not always strive with, uh, with man. Uh, the word strive means to rule, to execute, to content. God's saying, my spirit will not always deal with mankind. And uh, Jesus tells us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 8, when he says, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. And we can be thankful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. None of us would have ever gotten saved if God the Spirit had not come and convicted us of our sin and shown us our sin. Uh, there's a lot of people out in the water today out there in Kailua Beach. There's a lot of lifeguards that are on duty. And the lifeguards are not out there just randomly running and grabbing people out of the water and yanking them to shore and saying, stay out of the water. They're only doing that if somebody's out there crying for help. <laughs> help me, you know. Then the lifeguard will go uh, and bring, bring them in uh, and, uh, and do, uh, uh, do what they do so uh, faithfully here in the uh, Hawaiian waters. But uh, it's the same way. None of us ever never get saved until we, we call out. And we need the Holy Spirit to show us because we're incredibly good at rationalizing our behavior. Paul, in talking about uh, the false prophets and pa false apostles, says that, that when we compare ourselves with ourselves, we're not wise. Because we can always find somebody worse off than ourselves. And, and uh, people in general, uh, you know, given the, somebody that's just a radical criminal or uh, so forth, people generally see themselves as pretty good people. I can tell you, I thought that I was a pretty good person. In fact, I was even a pretty good drug dealer. Uh, I was a good drug, I wasn't a bad drug dealer because I was selected in the drugs that I dealt. And I didn't rip anybody off, I was a good guy. I was pretty, I was an honest drug dealer. In fact, you know, I would even pray God would help me and not get arrested and stuff, you know. I was a good, good drug dealer and I tried to deal mostly with my friends but I would deal with other people on occasion which is always very scary and stuff. Uh, but I was a good, I was a good drug dealer. You see what I mean? I don't, I, you know, we can rationalize about anything. And it was only the Holy Spirit that one day showed me that what I was doing was wrong. And it took a while before I realized that drugs were bad. Why would I think that? Everybody I knew did drugs. It was like totally normal. Weird people didn't do drugs. I mean, they were, I knew they were out there. I just knew there weren't very many of them. And they probably had uh, a lot of time on their hands or something went wrong with them. They were never introduced to this wonderful world of doing drugs. And uh, that's the, really the way people think. It's, it's amazing the way that you can justify uh, your, your because, you know, we're all, we're all pretty good people. <clears throat> Chuck Olson one time was uh, asked to speak uh, at a, uh, a luncheon by a Christian businessman, as recorded in his book, The Body. 
Uh, and, uh, and as they were kind of having lunch and he was going to be speaking afterwards, it was just a small group and, and he knew there were a lot of non-Christians, maybe mostly non-Christians there. And a woman said to him, uh, well, Mr. Colson, you're not one of, those, uh, one of those hell and fire preachers, are you? You're not here to tell us what sinners we are. You know, I hear enough of that on TV and those preachers. So he kind of knew what the crowd was like <laughs> before he, he began. Uh, but as he talked to them about the need for a savior and the depravity of man, he said, I, I quoted an old R.C. Sproul line when I said, each of you should know this, that you have much more in common with Adolf Hitler than you do with Jesus Christ. On a scale of who Jesus is and who Hitler is, you're a lot closer to him than you, than you are to Jesus Christ. We kind of miss this whole thing sometimes of, of the work of the Holy Spirit. We can be thankful. And the scary part is God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And that's a frightening statement. That, that a whole culture, we should be concerned about a, an individual that rejects the gospel and rejects the gospel and rejects the gospel and gets to the point where God says, I'm done. But here's a, here's a, a whole world that, uh, that uh, God says, I'm, I'm pretty much done with you guys. And then he sets a time period on it. He says, because man is only going to be around for 120 years. Again, two ways of looking at that. Some would say God is going to reduce the length of man's life to 120 years. Uh, or he's saying the flood's coming in 120 years. The judgment is coming in 120 years. After the flood, you've got Abraham living to be 175, Isaac 180, 80, Jacob 147. Uh, and, uh, and there are those, and they gradually, the lifespan decreases. And we talked about some of the reasons for that, the idea of a water vapor canopy around the earth prior to the flood that was not there afterwards and how that would have affected uh, our uh, lifespan and so forth. But uh, there's an interesting verse over in Hebrews 11:7 where it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Noah was warned in advance, and here God says, My spirit will not always contend with people I won't be there to, to draw them and show them and show them myself and get them to look in the heavens at night and be able to see the design of creation, to be able to have that conscience in their mind that tells them something is morally wrong or morally right. There'll be a point in time when I stop all of that, and in 120 years, judgment is going to come. So uh, guess what? Nobody believed the message, did they? You've got Enoch. You've got all these godly Men that are preachers, you've got Noah building the ark who was mocked and laughed at. And of course, their message was, turn and come to faith in God because the judgment is coming. That's still the message, isn't it? Uh, and it, and it still is mocked. Uh, and you can imagine the, the excitement and maybe how many people came to faith in God when uh, Enoch is preaching and then he is raptured. But how soon in the succeeding generations? Yeah, you've been saying that for 10 years. You've been saying that for 20 years. You've been saying that for 30 years, for 50 years. You know, we're studying Jeremiah on Wednesday nights, and we're right, right at the end. In fact, we went through uh, the episode of the fall of Jerusalem the other night. But uh, Jeremiah is on the scene for 40 years, warning the people of the coming judgment, and the Babylon will come and, and judge them. Uh, and uh, God was going to judge them because of their depravity. But uh, very, very few believed, very few believed. And we'll see that's the case with Noah as well. First Peter 3.20, just to look at that one more time. But notice what God is doing. When once the divine God, long-suffering, waited. What is God doing? He's being patient. He's waiting as long as he can in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So again, it's a depraved world. Uh, there's tremendous demonic activity in the world, uh, but notice the details of the coming judgment. Verse 5 to 7, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, 
creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So the details of this destruction include man's wickedness. And here is what we would certainly refer to as the total depravity of man. And of course, we've got a lot of people in our world today that would tell us that man isn't totally depraved, that man is basically neutral, and that placed in the right uh, environment, given the right socioeconomical opportunities, man will strive, man will do fine, man will be good because he is good and so forth. But that's not what the, uh, the Bible tells us. I often thought if you didn't have a Bible and you wanted to know what the Bible said, all you have to do is listen to what the world says, and it's, God's going to say the opposite. <laughs> you could, you could uh, just about place your theology on just going 180 degrees away from uh, the view of most people in secular society today. But the portrait of Moses of the pre-flood culture is uh, of that of being demonized, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's happened uh, in terms of many reoccurrences uh, over the uh, many as in as in not, uh, not a lot of, but in smaller versions of that. You have the Canaanite society that as Joshua does enter the land, God uses the children of Israel to bring judgment and wipe out once again. It's not worldwide, but it's to a particular culture because they have become so completely depraved. How bad was it? Well, just go back and read all the stuff. God says, don't do this, 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 and this, because that's what those guys are doing. It's, it's very depraved. And, uh, and again, the day that Jesus Christ comes back is like the days of Noah. And we start reading the paper and seeing what go, is going on around us. It starts sounding a lot like Canaanite society. The Herodians under, uh, uh, at the time of Christ, one writer said, was a cesspool of sensuality and, and violence. You have the Neros and Caligulas of the Roman courts that, uh, again, Nero was the, the guy that would take Christians and, and uh, take their bodies and cover them with pitch uh, and then hang them up in his garden and light them on fire so he would have light to ride around his chariot uh, in his garden at night. Men that are completely depraved and have a tremendous influence then on the culture that's around them. But we live in a day as well that's become incredibly sensual and incredibly violent. I just, there was just a story uh, night before last on, on the television about a little boy about 10 years old, this is on the mainland, who was found to have uh, been kept by his parents in a dog kennel for most of his life, was tortured, eventually was killed by them, buried in a shallow grave in the backyard. Uh, but those stories aren't that uncommon. I mean, the mom that puts her kids in the car seats and drives them into a river, uh, there's just horrible things that, that would be unheard of uh, a generation ago. Uh, the violence uh, that's, uh, that's out there. We, um, there's uh, videos that you can buy uh, where uh, there are videos of animals ripping people apart. People that are alive. It just got caught on video, a bear attack or whatever, and people rent these things. Kind of have the popcorn, watch the person be, be torn about. It's, it's a very violent society that we live in, uh, and it's, uh, it's very demonic as well. Uh, Mike Tyson, a number of years ago, when he was uh, trying to make a comeback in his career in an upcoming fight against uh, uh, Holyfield, said that, uh, uh, I'll do anything to win. In fact, I'll kill him. After all, I'm a convicted rapist. In other words, he's, he's bragging over the fact that he's a convicted rapist. That's even going to make him a better fighter. And remember, he's the guy that bit, bit the ear off in the middle of the fight uh, in, uh, in the ring. Uh, it's just uh, incredible the, the, the things that are going on. Are we in the days of Noah? Well, the other detail about that coming judgment is the reaction of God himself, which is striking in verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the depravity is not a temporary state. There's no relenting, no repentance, no hesitations. One writer said, lust was their media, violence was their, their method. So much that, that God says, who knows the thoughts uh, and the attitudes of every person on the planet and says, it was always continually evil with everyone. Uh, it's, that's how, how bad it was. And, um, <clears throat> but it's not that, uh, 
God is enjoying this. He's tremendously grieved over this whole thing because mankind is his handiwork, but his judgments must be judged and right. He gives people the opportunity to turn. Uh, Ezekiel, later writing from the Babylonian captivity, uh, speaking on behalf of God, says in Ezekiel 18.23, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? Later in verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God, therefore turn and live. Donald Barnhouse says, One of the marks of personality is feeling, and if God did not feel grief, he would be imperfect in his love. God truly does love us, and, the, and that's why his heart is grieved over this depravity. That's why his heart is, is grieved over, over our own sin. I remember hearing a pastor a number of years ago was having trouble with his teenage son, and, uh, and he was going to try to sit him down and try to talk to him to let him know uh, what was going on and just uh, you know somehow to try to get him to get his eyes back on the Lord and help him understand, uh, you know, the decisions that he was making and how it was impacting. And he'd been a pretty good kid all along, and he was just kind of getting off, and he was just, you know, wanted to try to nip it in the bud before it got worse. And he said he sat down with them, and he'd prayed about it, and he said, uh, uh, he said, son, I want to talk to you a little bit and everything, but I, I just want to do something first to help you understand uh, what uh, your mom and I are going through. Uh, because of some of your attitudes, some of the things that you've said, and so forth. Uh, let me just have your hand here real quick, and just make your 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 hand loose. And and he has kind of convinced him that this is okay. And then he takes his son's hand and he just slaps himself in the face hard enough to draw blood off his lip. And of course, his son is horrified at that. You know, oh, oh I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. You know, I, I didn't mean. It. And he says, No, son, you need to understand that. Every time you do this, that's what you're doing. You're slapping us in the face by your attitudes and your actions. But that's what you're doing to God as well. And he's grieved over it because he loves you. So we can read these things about these guys and go, yes, it was a, a terrible time. They are incredibly depraved. But also we see in it the heart of God. First Samuel 15, 29 here saying the strength of Israel is uh, just a euphemism for God himself. Samuel says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he's not a man that he should relent. Uh, you know, God, it's not that God's going to change his mind. It's not that God didn't know that this was going to happen. Uh, he did. But he still has a personality, and his heart is filled with pain over what is happening very early on in the creation of man. And then the details of the coming judgment, uh, again, the extent, I will destroy men whom I've created from the face of the earth. So it tells us that it was a worldwide, not just a, a local flood, but in the midst of it, verse 8, uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the first occurrence of the word grace in the Bible, it's worth noting the fact that it comes at such a time as this. When man is at his worst, God shows his grace uh, to, to one man. Uh, and it's important to understand that Noah was as much of a wretch as anyone else. But, but he becomes righteous by the grace of God. And he, he listens and hears these other messages from those from Enoch on down. He places his faith in God. And by God's grace, then he is saved and he develops a relationship with God, whereby it said that he walked with God even as Enoch walked with God. But uh, Noah left to himself would perish like everybody else. Uh, David was uh, a man who we would consider a righteous man, but we're very familiar with his sin. And in Psalm 23, 3, he writes, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And that was by the grace of God. Uh, by God's grace, he led David in paths of righteousness. But it was also the desire of his heart. He wasn't perfect, but that's what he was attempting to do. And I think that's what we see with Noah here. The text says he was righteous, blameless. He walked with God. He was a preacher of righteousness, but it was totally God's grace that saved him the same way that you and I find grace as well. Paul says, classic verse, Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And that is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. The gift is grace. It's not the faith. The faith is up to us. If we place our faith in Jesus Christ, his gift to us then is his grace. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. So very interesting, uh, the times of Noah. And then here's the quote from Jesus in Matthew 24, 37, speaking of the end times. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. The only hope for mankind is the grace of God. That was true in Noah's day. It's true in our day. And, you know, we, we pray for, for people to get saved. We pray for that God would bring in, uh, another revival, that in our lifetime we might see a revival uh, where God supernaturally just pours out his, be- his heart and, and people's hearts are, are warmed and, and turned to, to God in, in huge numbers. Uh, but there's no promise of that. That's what we, we pray for. Uh, and what it seems like is happening, is going to happen, uh, is that the days of Noah, things will get more and more depraved and more and more demoniac as time goes on. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, that's when I will, will come back again. Our hope is the, the marvelous grace of God. And the only reason that we are going to be in heaven is because like Noah was in the ark, the comparison in the New Testament, we are in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are spared from the wrath of God that is coming upon the world. It's a very real thing. Things were very terrible for Jesus to bring that kind of judgment. They will apparently get that way again. And uh, boy, if you just watch the news even a little bit, it sure seems like we're, we're headed in that direction uh, very, very quickly. I don't have to hide in the shed.